Okay, I got a okay that uh, I'm being recorded. Got it. Okay, yeah. Well, welcome everybody, uh, wherever you are. And so we're going to talk about soft pastels today, and then we have another class tomorrow where we go into oil pastels. There's a lot of similarities, but there are enough differences we thought we'd break it up. Um, I thought the amusing thing to me about the pastels is that when I first started working with Faber-Castell and I'd go out and do workshops and everything, they wanted me to pretty much demonstrate the whole line of products they had. And I always save pastels for the end in the hopes that I would run out of time so I, <laughs> I wouldn't have to demonstrate them because for years I avoided pastels like the plague. And speaking of the plague, that actually introduced me to um, the pastels because during COVID, um, I was asked to do a webinar similar to this one. And I thought, well, maybe it's time for me to kind of look at pastels. And I started playing around with them and I found out that I shouldn't have avoided them all these years. I really, it's one of my, my favorite things to use now. So I'll show you, I have a couple of uh, pictures just to see, um, to encourage you to what you can do. Um, this is the first one I did. And on the left side is oil pastel and the right side are the soft, soft pastels because I wanted to you know, kind of introduce the, the two and talk you know, all in the one thing. And the subject matter is one of those vintage mechanical monkeys that play the cymbals. Uh, his mechanism is worn out, but he still looks pretty good. Um, and what I have finally decided about the pastels, I started using pastels, probably tried them when I was like in junior high school or when I was pretty young. And I tried to get pastels to do what I was familiar with, like pencils. When in fact, um, you know, after decades of working with all sorts of materials, I figured out the best thing you do is test out your material and find out what it's really good for, and then find the application for that. So one of the reasons I decided I didn't like pastels in the past is because I didn't want to do a bowl of front fruit, I didn't want to do a landscape, and I didn't want to do a portrait of somebody's pet. So when I was asked to do the webinars, I looked around, I thought, you know, maybe I'd have more fun if I did something like one of my uh, more peculiar vintage objects that I always find around the place. So that's how I got started. And um, yeah, this is the first pastel that I did in the gap between I was in junior high school and uh, in the the play gears. So, um, you know, I picked it up pretty fast. And a lot of it has to do with my 50 some years of being an artist and experimenting with materials. But I found that pastels really um, are a fabulous medium to work with. They're very bright. You get really intense colors and they're just a few tricks or a few ways of using them that make them very effective as an art material for at least the way that I do things and, and the, uh, my application. Um, this is another, you know, just these, uh, I will be showing you the original pastels, but they're in an exhibition I'm having at a museum. But here's another one of my odd little uh, objects. It's uh, this clown. And when I was working with it, um, you know, I set up, I put lights on it. I like odd shadows. I like the idea that they're floating around kind of an infinite space. But with this one, this is a close up of, of it. And what I try to do is take some of the objects that are older and vintage. And instead of trying to make them look new, I want to emphasize things like flaking paint. And so, you know, this is a blow up of the pastel itself and the whole effective quality of, of paint flaking is just a matter of analyzing where little shadows and little highlights and where the color is. And we'll be talking about, you know, ob observing things. And then um, for this one, this is a cast iron bank of Popeye that was made in China. Um, it's a very, very odd interpretation, I think. I was fascinated by it, but for this one, I'll show you a blow up of the base. I was trying to use the highlight and texture in order to get a feeling for cast iron. So when you looked at this, you wouldn't think immediately that it was made out of plastic, but I would find some way of manipulating the highlights and the detail and the textures you can get on paper with pastel to kind of give you the idea that, oh, this is like a heavy um, cast iron thing. So um, we're going to 
Oh, also on the the links or in the chat room or or someplace, there's a document that is a blow up of the image that I'm going to be drawing from, so that you can kind of follow along and try things yourself. Um, the first part, I'm going to just talk generally about the properties of them, and then for what I hope to be the bulk of what's left, I'll actually start a drawing, and I'll talk to you about um, how to kind of incorporate the 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 qualities of the pastels to, to get something. Now, um, for me, I've been doing art my whole life. That's what I've committed to. That's what I really enjoy doing. Um, a lot of people may be getting started or somebody who has uh, always wanted to make art, but they were busy with the rest of their life. And now you're in a position, well, maybe you can do something. So what I'm gonna do is kind of gear it to a very basic level and then have you decide for yourselves what it is that you want to do with it. Um, you know, do you want to do something that's abstract? Do you want to do something that is more kind of cartoonish? Do you want to do something that's more realistic? Those are the decisions you can make for yourself and decide what you really love doing. Some people like doing, um, somebody do like, a lot of people do like doing things like flowers and bowls of fruit and stuff like that. And I, I do occasionally, but the burn of my stuff is more kind of, you know, what I've shown you something that has a little bit of a sense of humor to it. So with that said, let's go over the studio and switch to the other camera and we'll get started. Okay. Oops. I'm trying to get rid of my little, this meeting is record there we go okay here we go all right so i'm going to be drawing here and then over here is eventually what uh will be everybody has a chance to maybe kind of use this for a still life material and <clears throat> uh, from faber castell pointed out when we first came it on she said are those hair curlers and yes they are you know just these foam things with the wire in it and i like to you know make little knots out of them and sometimes it's sitting around and for me it's really a lot of fun to draw these things and you can see with a strong light now that's something i, I really recommend is i've got a number of lights that are in here purposely to create uh, a nice value of a range of colors so that you've got the dark shadow over here you got bright highlight here because this is a little bit closer to my light source that's off to the left so if you're drawing from objects, I really recommend that you figure out some way to get a really pronounced amount of light so that you have a combination of shadow and highlight. And that sets up the value distribution or the way that you can make distinctions between forms because generally like in through here, you have a shadow and that defines that edge. And then over here you have a highlight and then here you have another highlighted thing up against here. So those are all little cues that you can pick on in order to give uh, the rending of your objects a more solid feeling to it. So I, I just like the, the shapes and it's very simple. You could pick up a ball, you could pick up, you know, any number of real simple objects to get started um, until you start, uh, maybe getting a little bit more accomplished if you want to do something that's very realistic. If you want to do something that's more impressionistic, then you know, you're going to be more aware of what kind of uh, marks you make. All right, so um, the, this is you know, the, the set of Faber-Castell soft pastel shape. It's, it's like a you know, kind of nice square on one end, has sharp edges. And, you know, kind of look at it and you think about a pencil and it has a point on it. And as I mentioned earlier, the idea is to take the material and do, you know, take advantage of what it is rather than trying to force it do, to do something that isn't really equipped to do. Now, because of all these edges, I can draw a line when I kind of concentrate on the point of the square. I can also draw a thicker line if I go along this edge. And then if I want to put in more of a surface area, I can flip the pastel over. So you can make thinner lines, you can make thicker lines, you can make very broad strokes. Oh, the other thing I mentioned too, usually when I do these webinars, I have a camera that is showing down on the work, but for soft pastels, I like having it, you know, if you have a piece of plywood, 
I've got a small table easel. Um, you know, if you even have a table that you could rest a piece of plywood uh, and tape your paper to it or something like that. The reason I do that is that as you imagine, as you could imagine, these things are very um, powdery. And as I work, you can just see it and <laughs> it, it, it powders. And all that dust, instead of having it on the paper where you could be very easy to smear it, the excess gap, um, dust, the, the pigment will go to the bottom, will, will fall off. So that way you don't have a whole bunch of residual uh, soft pastel over the surface that would be very easy to smear. Now, <clears throat> so you can use very light pressure. And of course, you'll get a lot of the paper. And I mentioned about the paper. It's good to get a paper that has a slight grain. I wouldn't go to, you know, I'd get a real drawing paper that has some weight to it. And then I'd also get something that has a texture. So if you just barely rub on the surface, you can see how some of the white shows through. That's because the paper, you know, is like up and down, up and down, up and down. And if you put a light application, you just get it on the top little part of the grain with maybe a little more force. It kind of covers more of it, but you get a little bit of those white areas kind of coming through. And then the base of that Popeye, when I was putting black over it, I tried to keep some of that white to give you the, the texture that you would get with a whole bunch of little highlight, white highlights. Now, once you have it and you start applying it, and again, deciding, am I going to do line work? Am I going to kind of fill it in? You know, what it is um, I'm going to do. There are a variety of ways to uh, proceed. Now, you can, you know, your, your fingers are great for smoothing. And I think there's another thing that I found out uh, about my early approach to pastels. I'm somebody who blended everything, and it's not generally a good idea because then everything kind of blend together and go kind of flat and gray and you don't get very much vibrancy. But you can blend with a finger. They also have paper stomps. Fertilians is also another name for them. And they come in all sorts of sizes. Um, I got a brand new one already. My work area has gotten a little cluttered. So wherever it is, I don't know where it is. But this is also good for uh, being able to smooth. But as you put pressure on the soft pastel, you can see how the grain of the paper disappears. So this and that, uh, that's kind of nice. You might be able to find some way to use those opposing textures and the values of the color. And then of course, if I want to, then I can go back on top of it. And if I want to make it even richer, I can just add it on top. Now <clears throat> on something like that, pastels are fairly um, opaque. So even with a lighter color, once I have that down, then I can. All right, now the problem happens if, if this starts to blend, then you can see how that yellow starts to diminish. But if I keep on working it and putting more and more and more of a layer on top of that, and you can see how it approaches that, but it isn't quite as bright. So. A lot of this is a balance of how much do you already have down and what kind of strokes and what kind of layering you put on top of it, because you don't want everything to always just kind of go muddy or blend together so you don't have any distinction. But, you know, you could decide, like, you know, if you want to make that uh, a little more interesting instead of just a flat shape, you get out of a little that. And then you can start working out with your finger or your, your blending um, paper roll here. Now, the more I use this, though, it has a tendency to actually kind of take it off a little bit. Now, this is getting to be a really muddy color, and that's the type of thing that I try not to do. I don't try to get things so blended that it starts losing its punch or its impact. Okay. Now, as far as making blends, like in the background and things like that, if I want to, let's say, blend a, let's see, I'm still on camera here. Some yellow here, and then let's put uh, kind of a nice blue off here. 
All right, if I wanna blend those two together, again, I can use my finger. And what I recommend too, is either getting some diaper wipes or get you know some kind of uh, little fresh nap things here. Because eventually, if you get your whole fingers full of the powder, the pigment, and I've got pink all over my finger, and I go to start blending that, I'm gonna be picking some of this off my fingertips. So it's good to either have paper towels, a wet towel, or you know something like a fresh nap handy so that you keep your hands clean so you don't get it all over the place. But as far as the blending, you generally think about blending from the light into, let's make this a darker color so it's a little more dramatic. Okay, so if I want to blend those together, I want to kind of start with the light color and blend into the dark. And then go from the light into the dark. And then once you get it fairly well blended, then you can go through and kind of work with that. Now, if you find that some of it has gotten maybe a little out of hand, you can always add a little bit more over here. And then again, I'm trying to use a clean finger, blend that into there. So it doesn't take very much to get the blends. And what I find is that when you really build these up, they can be very vibrant. And that's what, you know, in the examples I showed you about what I do um, with a kind of an atmospheric background, you can get really, really rich colors. Okay, um, let's go to another piece of paper here. Now, <clears throat> my the, the thing that I like doing most of all is I do a lot of kind of more cartoon type things, or a little bit more like characters. And just to demonstrate, you, you don't necessarily ever have to do this, but this is uh, one of the ink pens that Faber Castell makes. It's a, a soft brush marker, but I just wanted to use it to kind of uh, do a quick illustration. So, uh, for some reason, I've gotten to the point where I like doing a lot of pigs. I've been doing pigs for quite some time. I think I have a, a head uh, genetic testing DNA thing, and I'm 99.9% .9 German. <laughs> I don't have anything but German in me. And as a kid, I just remember I could see my grandparents, and they had books and fables and all that stuff. And they used a lot of uh, animals to represent humans. And so I do a lot more animals than I do humans. I attribute that to my German heritage. All right, so this is kind of like a, a typical type of thing that I might draw. So let's make it a nice bright And what I'm doing with my own characters, I'm much more fluid and it's a different activity because when I'm doing observational stuff, I'm much slower, I build things up uh, a lot more analytically. And what I'm doing my own characters like this, it's just very intuitive. All right, so then let me uh, get some of that blended in there. I also want to show this. Sometimes I think, all right, if I show the stuff that I do that is highly realistic, I don't want that to be an indication that that's what you should be doing. And also, it has taken me years and years and years of observational conditioning to, to do that. Uh, it's generally something you don't just pick up. You have to really work at it. So if that's the type of thing you want to do, then it's just a matter of practicing and sketching and practicing, and you'll get better, and you'll get better, and you'll get better. But for me, this is something that I, uh, a style that I have evolved over a long period of years and I'm sticking with it <laughs> in addition to the other stuff. I mean, as an artist, you have the opportunity to do all sorts of stuff. You don't always have to do the same thing. So you can be abstract, you can be lyrical, you can be very precise, you know, it's all up to you. There's no right or wrong way of doing any of it. Okay, I don't wanna get too fussy with this because it's just, all right. So. At some point, you might kind of decide, all right, I'm, I like what I've done, and I'm afraid I might lose part of it, but I still want to layer it. One thing that you can do, I mean, a lot of people will ask about fixative. Now, what I'm doing, the really hyper-realistic stuff, 
I have a tendency to hardly use any fixative at all because a lot of times they're real subtle little things that may be affected by fixative. Now, normally I do this, um, I've got a spray booth that has really good um, exhaust, but since none of you are in the room with me, I will just take a, a chance with my health here. <laughs> and I'm gonna put a light coating of fixative on it. You can kind of see the way it blends some of that stuff together. So instead of having something subtle, it has a tendency, now it's gonna be less that so when it dries, but what I will do, once I get a basic color operation completed, then I usually do it in my spray booth. If you don't have a spray booth, then take it outside, uh, take it next to a window and have an exhaust fan because you do not want to be you know, breathing in fixative. Um, but now when this dries, it's not smeary anymore. So once I have the basic foundation into the paper and I give it a light spray of fixative, then when I go back, like I think we were talking about, you know, putting light colors on top of darker colors, but when I come back here now, this is sitting more on top and it's not blending with anything down below. So, and then if I get my really bright white out, then I can get really bright highlights there. And it's not mixing with anything below. So then that way I can start getting some marks. And instead of having everything all smooth, sometimes it's nice to have, you know, kind of a, a little energetic marking in there. And then eventually, you know, if I want to really put a lot of layers on here, I can continue to add to it and spray it maybe a little bit and then work it and then spray it. So that way you're building up in layers without the underneath layers mixing and polluting the colors. But again, you want to be very careful how you use it. You want to make sure it's in a ventilated area. And then um, just make sure that you're not breathing it. So, you know, I can additionally work on it. I'll just put a few more things on it and then we'll move on to the next thing. Again, what I like is a nice base. You know, kind of basic color kind of establishes where the lights and the darks are. And then I can start going, let's say that I want to put a little shadow underneath the arm there. I could take maybe like a more of a brownish color and very lightly I can kind of put something underneath that. And then I can blend that. And what I'm doing is just thinning out the brown layer and it's not mixing with anything underneath it. So it will give it a softer look. And I come in through here, I had that white on the top surface, so it'll blend with that. And I think one of the reasons I like kind of working like this, it's just intuitive. I'm just kind of letting the thing develop as I'm working. I'm never quite sure what's going to look like and it's till done, and until I'm done. And there are other times I'm much more contemplative and I like really analyzing an object and doing something that's very realistic. So for me, I can go from this to more of a realistic stuff. So again, I could go ahead and spray that, put more layers on, spray it, pour layers on. And what is kind of important uh, also sometimes is like, you know, when I get it to a point where it's almost finished, I can give it a little bit of a spray. Just give it half a second to dry. Making sure I don't breathe so much of this in that all of a sudden for the next hour you're thinking, did he pass out? What happened? All right. So now what's kind of helpful about this now is that if I decide what would be really, okay, this is going to be maybe a little too much, but if I put the background now, I can go over what I put on there and I don't have to worry about this really bright green being polluted if it accidentally goes over some of what I've already put in there because it's been sealed. Now, depending on how, you know, heavy I'm putting 
green on, I, I might get a little bit of the stuff underneath to come through, but this really kind of makes it a lot easier. So instead of having to be real picky about going in there and kind of putting the edge in without smearing anything in there, if I've fixed the key image, then I can start building up the background in layers as well. So, you know, it's not a bad idea to use fixative, but as I say, a lot of times if I'm doing really, really realistic stuff that has real subtle little changes in it, then I'm more apt to spray it at some point, do the final stuff, and then leave it at that. Okay, now the other tools that you might consider, uh, sandpaper, these are, um, okay, every once in a while I, I glance at my phone, I did, this is a fixative that I got because it's made specifically for um, soft pastels. And it's a good brand. Uh, when, when I was in undergraduate school, a lot of people used like Revlon or Aqua Set or something like that. They'd get some cheap hairspray. And for you know student work for stuff that you don't care about that's not bad it definitely will fix all the charcoal or the color or all that kind of stuff that is on your paper but it will yellow it's not archival it will eventually you know but most of the times when you're working on with life drawing or something with charcoal on newsprint those things are you know just kind of practice anyhow so if you do decide to get fixative I would recommend getting a good quality fixative I'd get a matte finish so that it looks more natural. If you get something that has more of a finish to it, uh, that's glossier, um, that would be fine. But I kind of just like it looking like there's nothing on it. So that's why I, I get that particular fixative. All right, now, so with your um, sandpaper, you can use just a sheet of sandpaper. These are made for, uh, you know, if you sharpen a pencil and you want to get a slightly finer point, you can use these. But I use it a lot, like if I find out that one of my pastels is getting really rounded, then you just a couple little light pulls with it and it'll sharpen that edge right back up. And so, um, you know, it's a way to keep a nice sharp edge. So if I wanna come back and maybe put just a tiny, tiny little, see I can, I can draw very hardly any pressure, very light on the paper, very barely touching the paper. And I can get a really crisp edge or I can get a real fine line. And in order to continue keeping that, then I can, I can get that by sharpening it a little bit. I mean, it doesn't take much. You just have to run it over a couple times. And instead of having a rounded edge, then you'll get a sharper edge. Now, the other thing um, that you can look at are erasers. And a lot of times, erasers are a great way to draw. So if we come up in here, so I got a bunch of pigment up in there. Maybe I'll even mush it in the paper a bit. All right. Now, a needed eraser. Yeah, this is one that, here we go. Um, this is a brand new one. And so this is one that I've been using and they call it a need eraser because as it starts, the surface starts collecting a lot of pigment and stuff. It's like kneading bread. And then pretty soon it's like, I don't know where it went, but it, this is a clean eraser again. So depending on how much, now the uh, favorite castell need erasers, one of the reasons I really like them, they're just slightly sticky. So if I put them down on something, put a little pressure on them, I can start picking up a lot of the excess and it'll lighten it up. If I want it to be a little more apparent, I can use a little more pressure. And so this is for more kind of soft, subtle changes. And especially, you know, if you've really rubbed it in, there's part of it that won't really come out with a neat eraser, but you know, I can start kind of altering how intense, how bright something is by removing some of the pigment with an eraser. So then the next thing you do, uh, we'll look at, I love these small vinyl erasers because these, you know, if you really want to trim up an edge with a little more pressure, you can get a nice sharp edge back. 
or you can actually draw with it. I can make distinct shapes, distinct lines by using the vinyl eraser. So <clears throat> erasers are good for sharpening edges. If you've gone over, uh, like you want a nice smooth edge and you've kind of you got a little over, then you can trim that up with your eraser. So the erasers, um, they also you can get uh, eraser pencil. So if you have real fine things that you want to get rid of, and these will sharpen a pencil sharpener, a handheld pencil sharpener, so you can allows you to get into really fine detail if that's what you need. So okay, erasers. Uh, we talked a little bit about applying the. Um, material and paper towels, uh, paper stomps, uh, chamois cloths, all those kind of things are good for blending or your finger. That's always nice. You usually have your fingers with you when you're, you're working. Okay, so now next thing, what I wanted to do is actually kind of apply some of these to a drawing. And <clears throat> this is a little still life that I set up and there's an enlargement of it, so you could really see it. Um, I took a photograph, you know, I mounted my camera in here, and I took a photograph of it. And so this image will be on the chat line or, or somehow. So if, if you want to use that, that as a reference to kind of show uh, a little bit more clearly what the object is. But as I mentioned, I like kind of taking everyday simple forms, simple objects, to work with. And I chose kind of a blue, yellow with a red background. So the first thing I do is sketch in. I've already kind of pre-sketched this in order to save a little bit of time, but there are a couple of different ways you could do it. You could use a fairly soft pencil with little pressure. What you want to do is make sure that you don't put so much graphite down on your, your pen, on your paper, so that it mixes with the color of the pastel because like graphite mixed with yellow will give you a green and you may not want that. Now, one thing that you can do, if I can, I always uh, end up, all right, I had my, okay, just more on second, there we are. Okay, tracing paper is a great material. So let's say that uh, I, was a little nervous. I didn't want on my good paper. Oh, the other thing too is I taped it with a glue tape because something that is really nice is that after, if you have a solid background, if you have things going all over the place, if you tape your borders out when you're finished, you carefully take the paint, uh, the the tape away, and then you have a really crisp border, and then that will make the drawing look even better. So that's why you know I have it taped up so completely. But let's say that you know I. I really love this drawing and I want to do it as a pastel. Let's say I did it with something else. Um, and you could do this if you're a little timid about your drawing skills and you want a little bit of a help, you could print out a photograph and do the same thing. But essentially, you know, just use your trace, your object or your photograph or whatever it is that you want to do. Okay, so I'll just do a little of this. I think you'll be able to see pretty easily how it works. Okay, so there I've got the image trace. Obviously, I didn't trace it all. Now, what you can do with this, turn it around, and I'm primarily doing the, the, the paint there. So I can see through it. So I can kind of take a color that is related to that and go over where my pencil lines are. Again, you know, if you outline the main shapes of your photograph, or if you have done a drawing as a preliminary thing and you want to transfer it to a good piece of paper, this is the way that you could do it. So I pretty much have, I can see where I put uh, pastel everywhere the lines are. And so then if I put it back on a piece of paper, and then with my pencil, I'll put it over here. Then what I'm doing is transferring the pastel onto the paper. 
So then that way, I now have an indication of where I want things without it being graphite or something like that. And if that's going to be a little bit too much, then I can always take my knee eraser and very lightly pat it, get the excess off, and I still have a pretty readable line there. So what I've done with this, I kind of used um, you know, the same technique. I did a drawing on the tracing paper and then for um, indicating where I want to put the shadows, I kind of sketched that in with red because it will blend in with the background, uh, the blue for the blue curler and the yellow for the yellow one. Okay, so let's get started. And again, if you think about light source, that's going to help you, um, you know, even, even when I do my characters, I want to thank if the light's coming this way, then I'll have a highlight up here, highlight on the top of the trotters, um, shadow down here. So even though this is a character, I still try to make it look like it has a volume. And those are the kind of tricks that you can, or the, the, the procedures you can use to help give it more of kind of a, a presence. So shadow up here, because the light's coming this way. So if you're aware of where the shadows and the highlights should be, then that'll help you out quite a bit. So if we look at this, and if you look at uh, the photograph that is online, you can kind of see where it's darker on this edge. When it overlaps, it's darker in here because it's not getting as much light. And especially with this one that's poking out, it's coming away from the light. So just kind of keep in mind where the brights, the darks, and the in-between uh, areas are. And the other reason I, I you know, like using these curlers is that there's usually a really nice transition going from a shadow to a mid-range to a highlight, and then you go back to kind of a, a darker shadow area. So in the beginning, that would give you something to kind of practice with. So I selected this one. And then usually if you can, if you're right-handed, a lot of times you want to kind of develop the whole drawing at the same time. You don't want to get into real picky detail until you have it pretty well blocked out. But if you go from right to left, there's less app that you're going to smear over what you've done. And the other thing that I recommend doing is taking, you know, some other kind of piece of paper or something that you could, you know, tape or or just have underneath it so that if you have to work in this area and you've already done something here, you're not gonna be smearing what's underneath it. And of course, once you get it primarily blocked out, then you can add the fixative and then there's less of a chance that you'll... Uh, so let's start with um, our yellow, our yellow uh, thing. And so I'm gonna just kind of come in, come in here and start to apply general color. And I'm going to follow where I sketched it out. And I probably, you know, now I'm getting into some areas that maybe, I mean, I've got several different yellows, but I thought I'd keep it real simple and just try to use the same one for most of it and then go back on top of it and work on it. So I'm just putting kind of a real quick layer of this yellow on it. Like that. Okay, let's see. Let me look at over here. Yeah, that, that. Oh, there's a little bit poking underneath here that I see. I don't want to cheat anybody. Okay, now I want to make sure that my hands are nice and clean before I start. Because yellow is, is probably the most vulnerable of the colors. Any, anything that is this bright and this light. But I'm going to kind of smear it around as if. It's flat. Okay. 
Okay, then I can look at it and say, okay, it's gonna be a little bit brighter on the top there. I'm gonna take my knee eraser. I'm gonna take some of that off. I'm starting to make decisions about what's the lightest and what's gonna be the darkest. So I wanna kind of get a highlight there. And I got more kind of a highlight over on this side. And a little more over on this side. Okay, so then let's get the blue in. Do the same thing. Now with the, the blue, the shape back there, you can kind of see where there's some highlights. It's a little bit, so I'm not gonna quite go up to that. Um, I gotta kind of put it in here like this. I think it's a little darker what comes around this way. Let's twist around with that one. Okay, on this one again, it's a little brighter at the top. It's definitely darker on this side. Oops, on that side. So I'm gonna put a darker concentration into there. And what I advise too is just, you know, start playing with these things on a scrap piece of paper, maybe, you know, just start to see if you can control the way that things um, go down and how you can build areas up. And if you go over your edges, something like that, don't worry about it. You can take care of that. All right. So again, very lightly. That was just like kind of a preliminary blocking in. Yep. This guy comes around here like that. Also, kind of sometimes we use your figure, you get a feeling for the form. You know, it, it comes down, it comes around, and then it comes over here, and then it goes into that knot, and then comes over here. So it helps you kind of intuitively know how this is going to work. And in this one, I had most of it over here, and then as I started spreading it, it got lighter and lighter. And that is pretty much the way it works. And then I'll come down with just a little bit over here, so then that the highlight appears to be more kind of in the center of it. Now, if you want, again, instead of using your finger, you can use your paper stomp. That will give you a little more texture as a result. You know, your finger at, or with a cloth over your finger can really rub that stuff in there. But my idea is just to kind of get started with uh, the basic forms and shapes here before I start getting real picky with, you know, trying to get some shadows and things like that. Out. Okay, so now let's get to um, the background. The background is uh, pretty easy. It's just flat until you kind of come to where the shadows are. And we'll get that in a minute.
Now, if you're thinking about, you know, doing something that is more kind of a design or something that's a little more graphic, is more kind of like a flat, you could be almost done at this point. You know, you just got this kind of blocked in. Again, it just depends on what it is that you're trying to do. You know, what is it, uh, what kind of art do you want to make? Now, I'm going to you know, try to make it a little more volumetric, but, you know, I could see at this point, you could do some patterns. And other things you can do too, is you can make shapes, you could use stencils, like, you know, if I decide that in the background, you know, I could put some stuff on a piece of paper and then just rub it up against that edge and then drop that, come down here. You know, maybe instead of having a solid red background, I might decide to kind of make it into kind of a scallop thing up up here. I got the rubber. There's just all sorts of things that you can do. And it's just, okay. So that has kind of a nice look to it as well. So if you wanted something to be kind of flat, but then also have little pattern. I mean, these are all things that you can do uh, depending on what it is that you want to accomplish. I'll leave this in at the top just because be a reminder. Now, in the event that you notice that you are getting a little extra soft pastel dust in areas, if you have like a really, really soft brush, and very, I mean, you just, the weight of the brush is more than enough. And then you can just kind of very, I'm just barely touching it, but I am getting rid of a lot of, and of course I might, Going to want to go over the whole thing, but you know, even if you accidentally go up against the interior of it, it's hardly going to show anything because this is so white and so subtle. All right, but we'll keep on going here. What I want to do is kind of get it blocked in so you can see what it looks like at that stage, and then maybe we'll just um, take one area and really develop it because I don't know that we'll necessarily have time to do the whole thing. Okay, now the reason I kind of kept that, um, I wanted kind of more of a maroonish color for the shadow. Now again, I can use the length of the, soft pastel stick to get that whole area covered. And then I've got some darker areas down here. And I've got kind of a shadow that comes across here. And again, I'm just kind of blocking things out in the generalities rather than trying to get the definitive uh, stuff because I know that I can start layering and go on top of it. And I got a little bit of shadow that comes over here. Okay. So now let me uh, get the old finger out. Can I get this going? Now this shadow is fairly crisp. I'll keep that. But then down here it gets a little softer. You get little, you know, kind of overlapping shadows and stuff. So I'm going to let that fade in the background a little bit. And a lot of times too, uh, if you notice the way to put, I don't have a real crisp corner here. I like the idea of making it look more infinitive, like infinity. Um, but then, you know, that's, that's entirely up to you to decide what you want to do. Okay, so after I get this kind of blocked in, again, it's a good idea to kind of get the whole structure or the, the foundation established right in the beginning. Don't, start up, finish everything, and 
and you're creating the, the whole context so you can start figuring out where the dark color should go, where the shadow should go, but you, you just kind of have it started at this point. And who knows, along the way, you might actually end up doing something that you didn't intend to do anything. Oh, wow, that looks better than I whatever I thought. Okay, so there's our beginning structure. And at this point, I'm going to give it, and again, this is a thing where I have it taped to a board that I could take outside or put in front of an exhaust fan or take into my spray booth. And you never want to spray it so that it, it it's so much on it, it starts to run. You just, a, a light spraying is all it takes. And we'll just give it half a second to dry. And then I'm going to start working on the blue shape over here and see what we can come up with. Okay. Yeah, it still feels, if it feels cool, it's still a, a little wet and drawing, but yeah. Um, I'm going to pretend that it's nice and, Okay, so I'm going to come in through here, and now I'm going to start thinking about where I need to put in more of the shadow areas. And then I can come in and kind of start blending it. I want to keep this as the highlight, and then this especially back here is definitely shadow. So because I've, I've sprayed it, I don't have to worry so much about mixing with what's underneath it. Now it's, this will get blocked in here. I'm going to leave just a little bit of white space that comes around. Okay, now I have a very dark shadow here. So I'll start off with this color. Now, the other thing, if, if you want to do things kind of naturalistic, this is round. So the shadow is going to fall and conform to that shape. Okay, so then it, it blends a little bit into here. It comes down. Okay, so you can see the way that I'm starting to pull with these values, I'm starting to pull the image out and making it look a little more solid. Now in some of these areas, then I'm gonna get a slightly darker blue and start beefing up, oops, starting to beef up things a little bit into here, because this is one of my darkest shadows here. I have to read more as a shadow. I make that distinction. And then back in through here, that's a little darker because it's... Now, if I don't like it on that yellow, And take it off of my eraser. So what I'm going to do now is just go back and forth between the lights and the darks. Um, I know that we're getting close to running out of time, but I can then, if I want to really emphasize that as a highlight, that I can kind of come back. And again, I want to make sure my fingers are nice and clean. And so I can smooth that out a little bit. Around. I'm sorry. What that was that? Question. There's, yes. there's a question out there, so I know we're getting close to time, but I want her question to be asked. There's a yes. question asking if um, that she smeared uh, the dark color over the light color, and how would she be able to fix it? All right. Um, you could spray it, put some fixative on it, and make sure it you know sets up, and then just go over it with a light cover. So let's say. I decide um, there was a highlight that somehow was on top of that shadow. So if I 
were to try to put that shadow in there, it would blend with the blue. So you might give it a quick spritz and then speed up the drawing. So then if I want to lighten that up a little bit, then it's more apt to work if I have sprayed it, because the thing that will make this like, you know, if I come up here someplace that um, if I put very light pressure on it, I can lighten it up. But if I put it down with too much pressure and it hasn't been fixed, then that blue underneath will start to mix with it. But you could use that to your advantage. I mean, you know, so let's say I decided that I got that top too dark and just come back with a white and I did spray it a while back, you know, when I had the whole thing blocked off. But now I can kind of come back and work it. Okay. And then if I want it lighter. So a lot of it is just, you know, you add some and you either leave the marks there, or if you want a nice smooth transition, then you work it through. So even though that was fairly dark, you can see now how that suddenly has become a lot brighter. And this one, I mean, you know, I really want to kind of keep it up more of a dark, so I'll take that out. But then, like, on in through here, if I want to continue this highlight, I just go ahead and very lightly put it in there. And then I can take, you know, generally speaking, you want to kind of blend the light into the dark rather than the dark into the white. Those are just, you know, kind of things that are recommended, but, you know, it's not going to hurt if you find your own way of doing it. And then I'm going to come down and crisp the shadow up. I've got to put a little purple in there. That's the other thing, too, is that, you know, what I like about pastels is they can put these other colors in there as kind of accent colors. So it reads, it helps kind of really deepen the quality of that blue, but it's actually purple. And so it's going to read as a deeper shadow. So when you're looking at that, you can say, okay, this is really starting to pop now. So even though it was all kind of funky looking when you first um, put it in, let, let me see, uh, I'll run too far over time, but, you know, so if I wanted to, I could start kind of pulling this one out now. And this guy comes like this, and then it almost turns green when it comes in here, but then I can start on it. Clean part of my finger here. So you can see the way that you can start pulling things out by contrast, by getting darker. Um, you know, the shadow, instead of adding like an orange or something to it, maybe I want to take just a little bit of brown. Oops. I just stepped on my light plug. Get the lights on here for a second. There we go. So this part has a bit of a shadow to it. So instead of using more yellow, I'm gonna use kind of this brown color and then wipe my finger off. And then I'm gonna use just, I'm gonna keep the yellow up here. It just kind of makes it a little more like, yeah, that, that part of it has just a little bit of a highlight. And then this comes around like that. And then just a little bit of a darker color down at the very bottom. Then there's another one behind that's going to be very dark into here, but just a little bit of yellow where the light comes in over there. Uh, this one is pretty much shadow over the whole thing. So we'll get that foreshortening. And then one other thing that, yeah, I'd like to, okay, so this is coming in like that. But then a lot of times if you have shapes, especially rounded shapes, they'll pick a little bit of reflection off of the background. So if our background is here, let me start kind of sharpening this up a little bit. That cross like that. And use this to help sharpen up that shape. I get a little bit of a purple shadow. 
So it doesn't take much, and all of a sudden, there you are, you're, you're getting it to pop. All right, so we got like that. Now, what I was talking about as far as this shape down in through here, I could continue that shadow all the way down, almost to the bottom. I want to make it really soft around there. Keep a little bit of a highlight here. I'll get rid of that red. Maybe not. But down there, I'm going to put a little bit of a glow. I'm going to keep the very bottom part bright. I'm going to make this more of an orange than a brown as it comes up. And then maybe put just a little bit of this orange in through here, because it's reflecting a little light that is off of that red background. I can just very gently kind of put it in. And then add just a little bit more color right there. So it's a little brighter, so it's really reflecting more. All right, and then Okay, so then at the top, I could um, now see I've got, you have more than just basic colors so that, you know, if I have a lighter yellow at the top here, you might want to put an even brighter yellow around here to get the feeling for that top. I can, you know, kind of come in and maybe at this point, you know, I'm looking at what's happening here, but then I'm also really focusing on what's happening on the drawing itself, because pretty soon I'm going to rely more on what I feel like I have to do in order to get the drawing the way I want it and less looking at my still life setup. Because once I get this kind of rolling along, Okay, so as you start making those decisions, I mean, when I look at my monitor, you can see how this is starting to pop off. Um, you know, if I come back and even, you know, it looks to me like even if I take a little bit of green back here and kind of, like that, and then maybe just a little bit kind of coming down here and make that a little bigger. Um, and then I've got this kind of maybe slightly orange color underneath here. That's the other thing too is, yeah, if you look at something and say, oh, that's yellow. Well, if you really look closely at it, it's reflecting other colors like the underneath side of that is picking up a lot of red that is bouncing off of there. And these are these little kind of details that you can add to stuff that will make things uh, visually a little more interesting and, and maybe a little more effective. So now what's really going to help a lot of this is when I come back with the yellow, I mean with the background. And if I can make, let's see, I'll find a nice crisp edge here. So I'm doing the background. I'm drawing the background, but it also is really defining by drawing the background very crisply like that. It also is drawing the object itself. Okay, so in through here, I'm going to want a really, really intense red. And come in. And... And that's something to point out too that, you know, instead of outlining this shape, you still get a real crisp edge, but it's the difference between this being solid red and this being kind of a volumetric yellow. So you could see that, you know, maybe with another 20 minutes or so, I could get this thing to look uh, pretty snappy. And it's just a matter of, of working on it. Um, I like this part up and through here. I think that that kind of adds to it. But, you know, what I probably would do is get it to blend 
uh, a little more solidly. Probably would add a little purple in there as well. Uh, but let's see if I really get a nice crisp edge there. That should make that blue really pop off. And comes here. All right, does anybody have any questions? I don't know if I've covered everything you need to know just to get started, but I think a lot of it too is that if you use some of these real basic techniques, and a lot of it is just, you know, don't expect it to look like anything. Just get started, start working on it, and as you go, you'll start to see what it is that you have to do to uh, make it start going the direction that you want it to. Now, <clears throat> let's, um, one last thing that I want to do is I want to kind of come in here. All right, I got that. Just wanted to show that, you know, shadows really do help create the space as well so i don't get too nuts with it but hey frost there was a couple of questions right here at the end they were asking yes. um the grit i guess the grit of the sandpaper yeah fine i would use like a nice fine you know 220 and then there's a question of if someone wanted to follow you how can they Okay, uh, on social media, uh, I have an Instagram account that is my last name, S-P-O-H-N, and then my first name, Franz. So it's kind of backwards. It's Spohn Franz for Instagram. And anything that I post on Instagram generally comes up on Facebook. It's automatic, but I really don't do very much with Facebook other than you know, what is automatically kind of picked up. Um, now, the one last thing I want to mention real fast, you can get, these are pit pastel pencils. And so sometimes it's the same, uh, Faber-Castell has a thing that they call index color. And that's when the pigments that they use in their pencils, their pastels, their watercolor, they're all the same pigments. So if you get a number 140, they have number, let's see, I don't know if you can see or not, but there's a number here that's 143, you know, get the name of it, but this 143 is the same as this 143. So I know that if I have some real small little details or if I really want to get an edge, then I can, use a pastel pencil that I can point. And then that way, you know, I can really get into the detail if I need to. Okay, so yeah, I mean, it's it's looking fairly good. I, I just wish that we had, <laughs> I wish I could draw as fast as I can if I fast forward something on a video. That's what I'd like. Just my hand go all over the place, but you know, I think it it, it gives a good enough uh, feeling for it and um, gives you an idea of what what you need to do. Now I should have done that. I had red on my finger and I just blotched that. So what I might do as a quick relief here, I kind of pick that up a little bit with my knee. There we go. See how nice it is. Oh wow, that looks good. Maybe if I hadn't done that, I never would have known. Okay, that really makes that pop because now you can really see the, the shadow, the effect of the shadow. Uh, knock that down a little bit. And then this might be, you know, the, the place to use the, the blue pencil right here if I want to kind of make this a little crisper. I just draw right on top of that. And there we go. Okay, any more questions? No, that's it. Okay, well, um, I hope that you've learned something. I have certainly have had uh, a good time doing this. And there we go. So everybody have uh, a good day and enjoy your pastels. <laughs>